Now, the progression went on. Uh, in about 1970, Forrest invented the the, the triode. Uh, prior to that, a gentleman by the name of Fleming in uh, Britain had uh, developed a, the, called the Fleming valve, which was uh, simply a rectifier and a diode. But De Forest came along and put a grid in the tube, which gave you control of it. Now, uh, the the use of the triode gave amplification possible, but. Um, uh, it wasn't until Armstrong invented the regenerative receiver that the uh, uh, capabilities of a single tube were really realized. And I think that, uh, that Armstrong should be given almost as much credit as De Forest because uh, he made the use of the, the tube possible by amplifying and uh, uh, the um, device was used in a regenerative circuit. Now various receivers came out. This, uh, this was the first commercial set that uh, was put out by, it was built by Westinghouse and uh, uh, sold by Radio Corporation of America. It's, this is uh, the type RA tuner. It has three controls on it, the tuner and the tickler and the, and the, the vernier. And then over in this case are three vacuum tubes. The uh, vacuum tube that uh, became the most popular in about 1920 was the 201A. And uh, uh, this, this has, uh, well, let's see, there ought to be some way to get this out of here. Uh, th this is a, a 201A and uh, uh, it was uh, a development that was made after the uh, use in, during the Navy of the VT-1 that was developed during World War I by, by the Navy. And uh, the 201A became a very popular tube, but it required uh, a six volts of filament and it took about a quarter of an ampere on, on the filament. And uh, so it required a storage battery and B batteries to operate it. So to avoid the, that, they came out with several other tubes that used uh, lower power. Now, also this, this has three tubes in it. The first one is the detector. And then you had two stages of amplification. If you were close to a local station, you could hear on headphones on, with just the detector. But if you wanted it louder, you put the plug in the next uh, plug here, which says first stage and then second stage. And then these controls control the voltage on the filament. That was the only volume control that there was. You people who are in, know about electronics know that, that we don't control the volume of, of a vacuum tube amplifier by changing the filament voltage anymore. But that was the way it was done in the very first. Then they came out with a smaller tube, a 199, which used much less filament current, but still, of course, had to have plate voltage, but it would operate off of dry cells. And then there were several other tubes, like the WD-12, which uh, I believe had a filament voltage of one and a half volts, and then the WD-11, which also had uh, low filament consumption. And in those days, that was a problem because you had to, uh, before everybody had a battery charger, you had to take your storage battery down to the local garage and, and have it charged. And most people had two storage batteries. They had one that they would use, and then they had the other one that they would be down at the garage being charged. So that was a, a weekly chore for somebody to take the battery down and get it charged so you could run the radio the next week. Then the B batteries, for the plate voltage, uh, this this uh, little radio here is a Crosley, and it is uh, it has three tubes in it, and it's it's a regenerative receiver, and it, it's a regenerative in two stages of audio, and these transformers here were the audio transformers, and when we build our own sets, of course, we um, were very careful to get the right kind of an audio transformer, and. Uh, the, each set also used a C battery. This is a C battery here. The, that was used for bias. And 